Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first Ada Lovelace Day 2020 uh, webinar. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be running this webinar series. We've got uh, five webinars for you over the next 24 hours. Um, and this first webinar is about water and energy sustainability. Uh, my name is Sue Charman Anderson. Uh, I'm the founder of Ada Lovelace Day. And uh, today I have uh, four amazing experts uh, with you to uh, talk about energy and sustainability and water. Um, we're going to start with uh, Kapua Smith, who is the head of sustainability for Contact Energy. She is our moderator for today. Um, we also have Andy Blair, president of the Geoth the International Geothermal Association. Uh, Dr. Eva Abal, Chief Executive Officer at International River Foundation. And Dr. Deborah Nair, CEO at the Murray Darling Wetlands Working Group. Um, so welcome to our speakers. Uh, we are going to have a QA and a uh, in the last 10 minutes of the hour. So if you do have questions, please put them into the comments and we will ask those at, at the end. Um, so that's it from me. I'm going to hand over directly to Kapua Smith. Um, and uh, thank you all. And I look forward to the conversation. Great. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, my name is Kapua Smith. Um, I am Head of Sustainability at Contact Energy, based here in New Zealand. I'm also um, a member or a, a descendant of the Indigenous people here. My tribes are Ngāti Puro, Ngāti Awa, Ngāti Apa. Um, I am involved, um, I guess, hands-on working in an energy company, uh, trying to um, address the issues of energy sustainability in a really practical way, uh, using the mechanisms we have um, as a corporate, as a, as a participant in, a, in the energy sector here. Um, I have a particular passion in engaging communities and engaging Indigenous knowledge and um, processes into uh, the work that we do in the sustainability space, not just in terms of energy, but also in terms of water. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. I'm going to now hand on to uh, my fellow colleagues and participants, starting with you, Dr. Eva. Thanks, Cap. Um, so I'm, I'm as, as uh, Sue has introduced us, I'm Eva Abal. I look after, I always like to think, I, I look after the International River Foundation and our, it's a, it's a foundation that is international but based in Brisbane. And um, of course, I've got um, a colleague here too, Deb, who also is a part of our committee um, and our board previously with the International River Foundation. So the International River Foundation um, works towards a vision of resilient rivers around the world. And and it's, it's interesting, Cap, that when you introduce the concept of energy, to achieve resilience in rivers, we strongly believe in what we call as cross-sectoral solutions. And we talk about cross-sectoral solutions as in we cannot just look after rivers just by looking at the water sector. So energy sector is very critical. The food sector is very critical. And, and so there's a holistic approach, as you probably would know and would really love. I know for most of us, uh, it's our first time that we've actually met today. And um, it's interesting that we, we share a lot of common, um, common uh, passion. So would love to continue this discussion as well. Thanks, Cap. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Um, I'm going to pass on to Deborah. Thanks, Cap, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Sue. So my name is Deborah Nias. I work for a non-government organisation in the Murray-Darling Basin area of Australia. It's called the Murray-Darling Wetlands Working Group. I'm the CEO of that organisation and have been for uh, 20 years or so. And it's an organisation that works um, on really on wetlands and, and rivers, primarily on wetlands. We try to rehabilitate wetlands uh, through standard rehabilitation methods, but also through applying environmental water and finding unique and innovative solutions to some of those ecological issues that we're trying to address for due to scarcity of water in some areas. Um, by training, I'm a, 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 um, I have a PhD in carbon dynamics of floodplain wetlands um, in, in Australia. 
and I've also served on the, on the various boards that are interested in water management and rivers, such as the International River Foundation, for instance. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, really excited to be here today and look forward to the next hour. Thank you, Cam. Thanks, Deborah. And last but not least, Andy, my fellow Kiwi. <laughs> Kia ora kapua, um, and kia ora koutou to you all. Um, my name is Andy Blair and I'm the director of a company called Upflow, uh, based in New Zealand but operating globally. So we're a geothermal science, research, consultancy and innovation company. Um, I'm also the president of the International Geothermal Association, so basically the president <laughs> of the world, geothermal. Um, the place that I love to operate is the nexus between business, science and community. So I love that space and I love applying science to real world problems and growing prosperity of um, communities. So that's my space. Great. Thanks, Andy. So I'm going to do a quick round and I'm going to go same order. The first question for us is, um, Eva, how did you become a scientist? Um, and can you give us some insights into your personal and career journey to date? Yeah, so my God, that seems like a long time ago, Cap. But if I if I start from the beginning, you might people might be able to guess my age then. And I don't know if that's good or bad, right? But anyhow, um, how did I start becoming a scientist? I actually started being a marine biologist. I studied marine biology in the university. And when I came to Australia, so I actually um, moved to Australia and did my PhD here. I originally come from the Philippines. And back there, I was already working on um, macroalgae. And it was around the more, um, you know, if I go back to to Andy, it's more about the, 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 the nexus between science and business because I worked in um, on macroalgae or seaweed that was actually um, exported for carrageenan products, right? And then um, when I came to Australia, my supervisor, who is now back in University of Maryland, said to me, well, macroalgae is not a big thing in Australia at the moment, Eva, but you know what's a big thing? It's seagrass. So I then decided to change um, organism and did my PhD on seagrass. And it was around, um, you know, looking at water quality and seagrass. Ever since, my passion has always been water quality and, um, you know, the use of, of organisms to, to track ecosystem health, basically. Um, of, of our waterway started in the salty part and then and um, I think I, I forgot to mention that before joining the International River Foundation I, I was in the university for a long period of time but also was seconded to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation so I did work on the salty parts um, in my career um, but mainly around I, I must have to say um, that I, I actually apart from doing my PhD and then a few publications after that I think I went straight to what we call as applied um, science. I actually did not go the, the pathway of an academic. Um, even if I was in the university for 20, 22 years, I was more in the applied science. And, and I think my passion is really around the pathway to impact of science. So maybe I'll leave it like that cap in the meantime and we'll, we'll go around and listen to the others too. Thank you, Deborah. What's your journey to becoming a scientist and to ending up where you are today? It's, uh, it's an interesting question because I'm still not sure I am a scientist, to be honest. Um, I think I can sort of trace back my interest in the natural world, I guess, right from when I was very young. We, as a family, would go bird watching and we would, I would catch lizards and snakes with my brothers in the local gully areas and things like that. And we used to spend time as a family out in the outback regions of South Australia big, large, outback, beautiful, uh, dry areas with dry creek beds that were just fascinating. Um, when I left school, I became a laboratory technician, a science laboratory technician. And um, over time, there were some people that I worked with who uh, strongly encouraged me to go in to do a Bachelor of Science and to sort of expand my, expand my knowledge and expand my interest. And so I, I did that. And a bit like Eva, I actually sort of got mainly interested in marine biology. But as time went on, I spent more time in these sort of outback regions, large inland floodplain areas of Australia. And I just, you know, knew I just loved them so much. And I was so fascinated with them. 
They wanted to study them more, wanted to understand how they worked, um, particularly in the moment of, you know, lack of water. Um, and I had I had a pivotal moment in my life when I was actually travelling through Africa and I was fascinated by the fact that there was a particular river that got turned off and then turned on on the weekends. And it got turned on on the weekends so that people could come and visit it. And it was kind of like the first idea of an environmental water flow that I'd ever heard of, and that was back in 1988. Um, and I found that really fascinating, and I wanted to sort of study and learn more about that. And so when I when I uh, returned back to Australia after that um, that period, I furthered my studies. I ended up into um, doing PhD in carbon dynamics of floodplain wetlands. And through again through sort of the intervention or the advice of important people in my life, I ended up um, into management and understanding uh, how is it that we manage these systems with uh, with water in a deliberate way and not not just uh, left uh, left to chance if you like so i found that um, really fascinating and uh, i've been in it ever since basically mm. awesome and how about you andy what's your duty to date so um i've got to say i'm more of a science groupie than a scientist now as well um so i started um I loved science um, from the very beginning and I, as far back as my memory goes, which is, you know, quite a long time ago. Um, I love science because I was really curious about the world and I just had lots of questions about why does this happen and how does that work and, and quite annoying probably uh, at my, you know, high school. Um, I lived in a, a small town, I still live in a small town that's surrounded by a booming forestry uh, commercial forestry industry and so I combined the two and, and did an undergraduate degree in forestry science and what I loved about that was the variety of work that I got to do so one day I put on my boots and I bashed through the bush and looked at trees and then the next day I'd be in the office and doing growth modeling simulation on a computer and then the next day I might be in a lab doing um, forest genetics work around like somatic embryogenesis and some of those um, biological science type things. And so I really loved that variety. Um, I moved into the geothermal sector about 13 years ago now, and um, I moved sort of more into the business of science. So finding science projects, negotiating contracts, building science teams, that sort of thing. Um, and I found that I loved that space much more. So instead of wearing a lab coat and doing the science, I loved hearing about the cool science and thinking about how to apply it. Um, so I'm, I'm a lazy scientist and a bit of a groupie. Um, about three years ago, I started up Upflow with my business partner um, and basically, we want to pull in science to commercial organisations. So we know that organisations never hire enough people to do R&D. You know, they never say, well, let's hire another four people and we can all do R&D. And so how, you know, I'm looking at how do we build in science into commercial operations? Um, basically, uh, we, our number one policy for our company is let's do cool stuff with cool people for the planet. And um, I'm really passionate about that stuff. I love working in geothermal. Um, people in this industry don't work in geothermal because they want to make lots of money because that's oil and gas and other big paying sectors. So they all have that altruistic sort of feeling about we're all doing something really good for the planet. And they also are really smart. They love complicated problems, complex things to solve, and, and they like to share. And so I, I just love this industry and I'm glad I'm a, I'm a science groupie uh, in this space. Um, yeah. So that's yes. where how I got to where I am. How about well, you, Kapwa? I have a confession that I am, I think, the least sciencey of us all. I actually don't have a science background. Um, I came through, um, I guess, as a child, an alternative education system, a kaupapa Māori education system, where I was raised to believe the environment and myself and my family were interconnected. So we had quite a, a different connection with our natural resources. I think Māori first, I think that was the the legacy uh, from my early education and I took that with me through to university. I did actually start doing chemistry and marine biology at university uh, before shifting across to Māori studies and really looking at um, Indigenous knowledge and the way, for me, one of the things that really incited quite a lot of passion was the way Indigenous knowledge had something to contribute 
um, to a lot of the challenges that we have as a society and yet had not been weaved in um, into the types of challenges or thinking that we were doing at the time. So I actually did my um, dissertation on the way uh, policy and legislative outcomes shape uh, cultural identity, social identity within communities. And I go back to what you said, Andy, in your introduction earlier around your interest in the nexus between science and communities and um, corporate uh, organisations. And I'm equally interested in that space, but where I see myself playing quite a key role is um, bringing two knowledge systems together or bringing together diverse uh, ways of thinking, those integrated thinking pieces, which you mentioned, Eva, which is required um, to think in a sustainable way, how water interacts with um, the energy system, how communities and uh, renewable energy uh, come together towards creating that balance. Um, that's the piece that I'm really interested in. And so working in the space that I'm in now, so for me, that's how I got into sustainability. Uh, and then within contact, um, my job is a connector between all those different knowledge systems, all the different types of people, um, and really bringing it in to help solve challenges. That's where I think uh, my main focus is at the moment. Uh, so that's a little bit about me and my background. I'm the I'm a science groupie too, though, because I absolutely love working in geothermal, uh, which is how I know Andy, because we are a big geothermal generator as well. So it's a really exciting space to be in. Uh, the next question is, Eva, um, what research or work are you doing at the moment and what is its likely impact on water or energy sustainability? You're on mute. Thanks, Cap. I'm sorry. Um, so it's really interesting when you say research, right? So I've heard, I think, for, for the four of us, um, hands-on research, probably we're not, we're not, I'm not really not doing hands-on research, but maybe I'll re re rephrase that in terms of what science campaign am I on about? So within the International River Foundation, I am pushing for two, what I call as science campaigns. One is about voice for our rivers or a voice for our waterways. And it's really around developing uh, mechanisms by which we are able to tell each other, the community or the world, um, the health of our rivers. And that is in the form of report cards. And I know if you're familiar with that, Deb, you're familiar with that. It's really developing river report cards, um, you know, um, converting what, what we get in terms of, let's say, water quality monitoring or, or even community, river community monitoring, converting that into an easily understandable uh, type of communication product in a report card, which is very easy to, to use. You know, we all have kids or students who would come home with a report card and and then we would know how these kids or how are how are the students faring in terms of you know their work in school because the report card is what it is you know a for good or f for fail so it's as simple as that so there are numerous report cards being done around waterways around the world now so when i started back then with healthy waterways um back in 1998 was when we first launched the report card for our waterways and it was received, I think, in, with mixed emotions. Um, some people really loved the concept. I know the politicians were very wary about it because for the first time we are able to talk about the health of our rivers in terms of a single letter that the general public could easily understand. And I think I'd like to share this. One of my most heartwarming experience was I was catching a taxi to one of our report card launches and um, the taxi driver was asking me, oh, where, where are you going? I said, oh, we're going to launch the report card this year. And I think we were just in our 10th year of launching of the report card. And he said, oh, so would the Brisbane River be a D? And, and for me, you know, for a general community, you know, epitomized by a taxi driver being able to say, is the river a D? You immediately know that the community is really grasping the science, right? So this is back again to my vision of path to impact. The second one, Cap, if I may just quickly, it's, it's more around rivers for future generations. And this is where the concept of resilience, the team, the team in the International River Foundation, Deb included, we're really pushing for a vision towards resilient rivers. And last year, during our river symposium, we've actually launched the first International Resilient Rivers Blueprint. And, you know, it will probably take me a day to talk about it. So maybe I'll leave it at that. It's really about 
converting our existing integrated water resource management plans for river and and pushing them a notch higher to become to actually aim for resilient rivers because our rivers are deteriorating so fast in in fact i was talking to one of our colleagues in in the danube deb you know phil and he mentioned that the rivers are actually um the 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 most degraded systems in the world so but if we're thinking of rivers for future generations, they're deteriorating so fast. So the innovation there is what do we need to do to, to, to not only halt the deterioration, but to actually improve it so that ge next generations would still have these important assets in their lives, right? And this is where we were looking at in terms of the four-pronged approach in, in achieving a resilient rivers. So, so that's probably the two ones I think have, um, if I could synthesize, it's around a voice for our waterways and rivers for future generations. It's awesome. I um, come from a tribe and we have a saying, I am the river and the river is me. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at at the moment in terms of the energy space and our work uh, with Tangata Whenua is how do we bring cultural indicators of well-being into the monitoring work that we're doing, not just in terms of waterways, but also in terms of energy developments and geothermal developments. Andy, I'm wondering, um, what research have you got on your radar at the moment? So we've got a couple of really cool projects we're working on at the moment. Um, one is called Goomal. Goomal, like Google, but not like Google. Don't <laughs> sue me, Google. Uh, geothermal operational optimization with machine learning. So it's a U United States Department of Energy funded project where we're building machine learning algorithms um, to optimize geothermal surface assets. So we're working with your team, Kapua, in uh, Waidake. Waidake Geothermal System is one of the oldest uh, geothermal projects in the world and it's very complex and so it's an ideal start point to try and build an algorithm on. My machine learning team says the more difficult the better which they've asked for it and they've got it and basically we're building algorithms, um, doing forecasting, we're using neural networks and reinforcement learning techniques to um, try and optimize or grow the outputs from geothermal steam field assets so more power just by being smarter about how we shuffle things around. Um, the, the, the goal we're, we're doing, we're gonna share the algorithms to the world for free. So our goal is to make geothermal projects globally more economically competitive. So, um, so we have more geothermal projects around the world, which is you know, good for our, us and our planet. Um, the second project that we're working on is called uh, Geothermal The Next Generation, and that's a supercritical geothermal project. So we're looking at New Zealand supercritical reserv uh, reservoirs in the subsurface. So supercritical is basically, you know, we have states of matter and supercritical is where, you know, uh, a liquid and a, um, a gas come together at about 374 degrees Celsius and about 22 megapascals, it creates the supercritical uh, uh, state of matter that has like 10 times the amount of energy than existing um, conventional geothermal systems. So 10 times more from the same place. Um, so we're spending, we're getting scientists together looking, it's like going to the moon, but deep. So for us, it's really exciting. It's a whole new landscape to look at. Um, and we're doing it because it's really important for New Zealand to chase those uh, carbon targets, carbon emission reduction targets. Um, Geothermal, the next generation, one of the, um, the reasons why it's called that is it's not just about the science, it's about integrating knowledge into communities. So we have a really strong work stream, which is one third of the project, where we're trying to grow the next generation of geothermal scientists. So we're trying to get a whole lot of young people involved in the, in, in the project to grow them through this. The next generation of leadership, so that that is as well as um, Māori um, decision makers and, and giving them the information they're going to need to make future decisions about these kind of projects um, and regulatory space as well. So um, it's a big project um, funded by the New Zealand government, but we're, re we're really excited about it. And um, so those are just a couple of um, projects that we're working on at the moment. It's pretty awesome, Andy. What about you, Deborah? Um, so 
the, the, the work that we do is uh, very much about an integrated approach to um, trying to improve wetlands and river management. So we work with landholders and traditional owners and government to find ways of improving wetlands and, and river management. Um, most of the wetlands in the Murray-Darling Basin are on private property. So we work directly with private landholders and uh, farmers and landowners, you know, viticulturalists, horticulturalists, these sorts of people. We work with these people across the basin to try and uh, bring together a vision for, uh, for, this, for this wetland and for this area. And so we work with them. It's very much a people space. It's not so much a science space, but we bring the science to people and we explain uh, this is how we understand how these systems work. And if if this is your vision, then this is how we can help to realise it. So we work in that sort of communicative space there. And then we try to bring resources into managing those wetlands to improve them according to those sorts of visions that the landholders or the traditional owners have. So that's just to sort of paint the picture of how we go about it. But the, the main projects that we're involved in at the moment, are uh, uh, we've been... Uh, working with the Nari Nari Tribal Council, traditional owners up in the Murrumbidgee area on a very large area called, it's, it's known as uh, Nimikara, or it's now known as Gaini Nimikara. Gaini is the Nari Nari word for water. And it's about 85,000 hectares of land that's now been handed back to the Nari Nari. And we're working with them and the Nature Conservancy of, uh, of Australia, as well as the University of New South Wales uh, to implement the land and water management plan there and learn how to go about doing this. This is a large area, massive floodplain area. So we're all learning as we go. And so instead of that research mode, whether we do real research, it's more about we do learning by doing, you know, we do adaptive management, we try something, does it work, does it not work? Even if it doesn't work, we still learn something, hey? So we kind of try to do those sorts of um, approach to the way we do things. There's obviously that research that goes on around us that we can engage with um, uh, trying to work out what birds use, which wetlands and how and when and, and why, for instance, you know, those sorts of things. And one and the other one of the other major projects we're involved with is um, with the Environmental Water Trust, which is a very unique, um, a very unique organisation in that it's uh, the first of its kind in the world that uses impact investment to um, uh, purchase water entitlements to be able to put water into uh, wetlands. And so this is an impact investment scheme that was set up. Uh, by ourselves and the Nature Conservancy Global and Australia and with Kilter Rural and we all uh, work towards uh, showing impact investors uh, how they can be involved in um, rehabilitation and still get returns on, on their funds and this as we know going forward this is one of the biggest issues is finding the funds to do the work that's required um, to do the research, to do the, the actual on-ground work. And we, we're sort of trying to sort of demonstrate that this is one way for corporate organisations um, and individuals, wealthy individuals, for instance, to, to get on board. And that's a very exciting project. It's uh, about five years into its into its 10-year period and it's so far proving quite successful. And um, the advantage that this has given us is that we're able to work with um, and many different groups, traditional owners in particular, and this is very much an emerging area for us as well as working with traditional owners and, uh, as you say, Kat, bringing in that, um, you know, Indigenous knowledge and working, really working together to build capacity across all sectors and across all people towards a, a common a common goal, whether that's for birds or fish or for spiritual and cultural. Um, it's It's individual objectives that we look for in that way. So, yeah, exciting times, to be honest. Yeah, that's really awesome research as well. Wonderful stories there. I guess for me, um, I'm less involved in the research space and more involved, I guess, in the practical application of some of the things which are coming out of our wonderful scientists and people actually learning um, how these systems work. I guess the core part of my role and something that I'm heavily involved in is solving the challenge of how do we decarbonise the electricity sector in New Zealand. Uh, so 5% of New Zealand's total GHG emissions come from the electricity sector. We know we've got to get our um, 
renewable energy, low emissions energy uh, generation up. Uh, we believe that geothermal is a pretty key part of doing that. Um, and so investing into um, uh, understanding the geothermal system, how we generate geothermal electricity in a more sustainable way into the future has been a really core cool part of what we're doing um, at Contact, but also solving the issue around um, how do we decarbonize industrial uh, processes, uh, which is where a lot of the fossil fuel uh, emissions are coming from. So as an energy company, how do we utilize our knowledge uh, to not only reduce our internal emissions that we're generating through electricity generation, but how do we support large industrial users of fossil fuels in New Zealand uh, to uh, transition away uh, from that as well. So that's been a key part of our work um, at Contact. And it's really awesome to hear all the research that you're all doing, because I see how it all connects into yes. one big system. So, you know, obviously any energy generation, geothermal is one source, but we're also heavily involved in hydro generation, which has an impact on waterways. So when we're talking about energy sustainability as a concept, I'm always mindful um, of the connections, particularly between our environmental and natural resources and the communities, the indigenous communities and people as a whole, because it is, we need each other to survive. So mm -hmm. that's just a little bit about my stuff. It was a long-winded way of saying I'm not doing any actual research <laughs> projects at the moment, but <laughs> looking at how we apply them. But I guess going back to that question of research, I've got two questions in two parts. One is, what is your greatest challenge? And the second part is, how do you go about attracting investment or funds into the research that you are passionate about? Starting with you, Eva. So um, uh, when you when you talk about the the challenges, I think um, I, so. So in terms of the research cap, I, I probably would start with the research first, then, um, or maybe I'll start with a personal career. So as a, 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 one of the one of the challenge in a, in a science career, and I think we talked about it, is is that whole dichotomy, right? Of where we where we take ourselves, and I think for our audience this is very relevant. When we do a science degree, do we go the path of a traditional academic research, you know, pure research focus, which is also very satisfactory and very enjoyable, actually, this quest for, for knowledge in a, in a very traditional academic way. Or do we go where we most of us are now? Do we go the more applied science? And I know when I finished my PhD, I was in that, in that middle of this dichotomy of bi bifurcate uh, journey, right, of do I just go back to the university? I mean, it's it's comfortable, especially when you've done your PhD, it's comfortable to stay in the lab, as Andy's saying, you know, wear a lab gown, but mind you, working in sea, with seagrass, you, you hardly wear a lab gown unless you're in the laboratory, right? You're actually always stuck in deep mud all the time, trying to get the seagrass and, and you know, diving in, in muddy areas. You don't even dive in beautiful areas, right? So, so, it was comfortable and it was very gratifying to actually then do a publication and when the publication gets accepted, that's fascinating, right? Or then I, I chose the other way. I actually, as, as Deb said, I chose more in the science management, science coordination, you know, the, the linking of the science to, to more the end user side when I joined Healthy Woodways. Still seconded. I think my, my fort I was fortunate that I was still seconded by the university. I was, um, I think, grounded within a, an academic institution, but um, seconded so that I was given a chance to actually look at the application of science and and that love for for water and waterways as Debs indicated with hers mine started with actually working for the healthy waterways campaign here in southeast Queensland so in terms of, of what is what are, what are the the challenges associated when we do research in water or research in rivers there's a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of competition, right? When we, when we, we do that in terms of funding. So when we look at why a lot of our rivers are deteriorating around the world, there might be two factors if I could identify. One is the lack of funding and that we have in some of our river systems, we've actually degraded them too much that it's so hard to pick them up, you know, and it would cost a lot to actually restore them. So it's definitely a financial issue. And the other one, and, and 
especially when you look at transboundary, those big river systems, you know, it mainly is around institutional arrangements. You know, how, how does one government deal with this part of the government? How do they deal with the community? As you said, Cap, you know, how, how do they then take on the science? Do they actually, um, you know, listen to the scientists when they actually implement uh, what is good for the river? So those two, I think, are the most critical challenges that um, integrated river basin plans need to face for them to be successful. The more effective, effective institutional arrangements, having, you know, a champion for rivers is probably what I'll capture it as. And the second one, second one is really around um, innovative financing that, that can actually be used to, to restore and or protect our river systems. Thank you. Um, Deborah, what has been the biggest hurdle that you've encountered um, while building your science career and how have you um, overcome those challenges? Uh, I think my biggest hurdles are around myself um, and lacking confidence at times and, you know, unsure about myself and those sorts of things and what on earth would anyone want to, you know, ring me up and get me onto something like this for, you know, what on earth have I got to say that's in any way interesting or important or significant so i think there's uh, i think you know most of us kind of can probably identify with those sorts of hurdles and i i guess i learned how to get over those sorts of things is uh it's about taking yourself out of your comfort zone you know it really is it's uh, you need perseverance and tenacity in this field and i think that's the same in probably most fields but you need to be, uh, you know, you need to maintain that perseverance. It doesn't happen in a year. It doesn't happen in three years. Um, Eva's only slightly older than me. I know that for sure. Um, <laughs> it's taken us quite some time, you know. And so I think that uh, that's just something that people need to remember. It takes time. Um, and, yeah, get yourself out of your comfort zone, I guess, is what I would say. Um, if you are not particularly great at public speaking, perhaps that's what you should be doing. Um, if you're not comfortable with, going into a room full of um, landholders or, or, or whatever, or farmers, perhaps that's what you should do, you know, with some, with some good friends behind you and some, uh, some good advice and, um, and with some humility. Um, I've been particularly enjoying lately the uh, learning that I've had with working with Aboriginal people in Australia, and I've just learned so much and I've had so many of my ideas sort of pushed aside as a result of that kind of collaboration. And it's it's exciting. Um, and it's, yeah, it's kind of get yourself out of your comfort zone, to be honest, is, is how I see uh, from my personal personal viewpoint. Mm. Right. And what about you, Andy? Any insights to share about, you know, the hard stuff you've faced in your career to date? And what can you share with our audience? Well, I think um, one of the, I've got a couple of things. The first thing is that um, a lesson I learned um, some time ago and have to keep reiterating to myself, reminding myself is that perfection is paralysis and you just have to let go of perfection because it never actually exists. So just, you know, 80% is good enough and get on with it. Um, otherwise you'll do nothing. Um, I think also that um, we're all imperfect leaders there is no such thing as a perfect leader. We're all still on a journey of learning. Um, just like Deborah said, you know, we're all on a pathway of learning and we're still, we're still learning. And so don't be afraid to, you know, step in and do things, you know, be courageous. You know, what was that quote? All you need is 17 seconds of, you know, courage, insane courage, and you'll be surprised at what you can do. I would say, similar to what Deborah said, you know, push yourself and have a go. Um, what's the worst that could happen? Um, you might become the president of the world. Um, I would say that one of the key things that I struggled with um, on my way in my career is uh, the realisation that my personal growth was happening at a different rate than the organisation that I worked for. And so basically my learning and how I wanted to do things and how I wanted to operate and the things I wanted to do and focus on were starting to become, you know, a lot different from the organisation I was in. And it caused quite a lot of frustration for me personally until I realised that it's actually the organisation isn't going to change. What's happening is I'm changing and that I had to decide to accept it or move. And that scary move um, has... You know, I've never 
uh, had a worse off situation from moving um, to something else and trying something else um, and choosing what I, I love. And I would say, the last thing I would say is that any choice that you make with integrity, you will never regret. I've been mm. in difficult situations before and chosen what is, you know, if I step over it, I endorse it. So chosen my integrity and I've never lost a day of sleep. So um, those are just a couple of um, things maybe that I've gone through and, and thought about over the years. Cool. I guess for me, and I, I'll take the personal track, I think, in terms of the challenges I faced, a lot of it has been around my own insecurities as a woman, eh? um, in a largely male-dominated sector, um, as a non-scientist and as a Māori. Um, those three things combined, um, they actually played with my mind for quite a long time, but I'm now at a place where I've come to realise my strengths and the strengths that I bring to our team. And it is a team approach. You know, we talked about, when you talked about it, Deborah, collaborating um, with different people and bringing in the diversity of thinking, the diversity of ways of thinking um, into solving these challenges. And I think that's a really key part of what we've been able to do um, at Contact. I will say that having gone to, you know, the Indigenous language schooling um, uh, system uh, and then coming into university was one of the reasons I didn't carry on in science way back in the, um, well, it's not that far back, but way back in the 90s. <laughs> um, I, struggled. I struggled with um, the difference between the way I was taught to think and learn and the way I was um being taught in a university, very structured science system. But I have seen so much change over the years um, and I am just incredibly impressed about how much change has happened within our sort of learning institutions over that time. I am um, terribly impressed with the openness of organisations to embrace diversity, um, even though it's tough, even though it challenges people in different ways um, and how you overcome it and the kinds of amazing outputs you can put out uh, when you start thinking about uh, different ways of thinking and doing. So an example of this that I can share with you, which we've um, gone through at Contact, is, again, using our traditional science view on the geothermal um, system management. Uh, and when it came to sort of talking to communities about what we were doing, we'd go, this is it, outwards. Whereas we've now taken the approach where we work with different kind of groups and we go, actually, you educate us, teach us, and wow, what a difference it's made um, into how we view the geothermal system, how we work with communities, how we sustain it um, into the future. And it was a shift of attitude. It was acknowledging that, you know, we don't just have all the answers. We've actually got something to learn. And by being open to that learning, recognising the diversity, we don't speak the same language, but we all have something to offer that's been really very helpful. So that's, that's I guess, my challenge um, that I've faced and that I'll put on the table. The next question I've got, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to this question. What are some of the unsolved scientific problems in your area, Eva? So when, when uh, so when, I think I touched a little bit of that cap in terms of the, the scientific problems, I think more, um, so I, I can probably think about um, my experience when I was with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, right? Um, the government and and organizations, even, you know, corporates actually invest in a lot of science in the reef. And, and they have to. It, it's actually one of the, you know, one of the seven wonders of the world. So it has to be preserved and looked after and studied and understood. So there has been a lot of, of dollars um, actually allocated to do research on the reef. And, but of course, from a research point of view, there's never enough money, right? Because science is such a, uh, a long-term uh, vision that, that we, will, we will always have questions in what we do. I think one of the challenges we will have, whether it's for the reef or whether it's for the rivers, is that sometimes we, we stop short with having a science result. We need to move further. And, and, and you've heard this from Deb and from yourself, Cap, that, that really there is a need to then move on to the uptake, to the adoption of the science. How do, the, how do we then com 
communicate the science so that it is actually embraced by decision makers and so that they could do something about this result. So that's one. And I think I've, 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 we've made the challenge uh, a, a passion for us in the organization by then talking about a voice for our waterways. That means we have to be able to communicate better to the community in terms of what the issues are associated with, with the rivers or, or associated with the research that has come out around our waterways. I think, and I don't know if some of you will, will say the same, for me, when we talk about environmental systems, the challenge we have with them is always time, you know, time in the sense that, you know, as I said before, rivers are deteriorating very fast. But at the same time, we feel that the investments are not, that are not going very fast. And then to, to, to com compound that is actually the concept of global change or climate change, right? So it's happening but we feel that the actions are not as fast to actually ensure that we have this system still available and still beautiful for future generations. Yeah, cool. Deborah, what about in your area? What do you think uh, some of the key unsolved scientific problems are? Oh, I think there are many, uh, but I think one of the largest ones is the impact of climate change, the impact of less water on our systems. Uh, this is, you know, the, the problem has been well described. I don't need to describe the problem any further, but it's about how do we, how do we build in this very long-term thinking and we need to build it in now. It's not happening in 20 years. There's sort of like this mantra sometimes that climate change is coming. Um, climate change is here um, and we need to be thinking now for 20, 30 or longer period of time. You know, many of the plants and species that we deal with uh, live hundreds of years. You know, river red gums can be up to a thousand years old. Um, you know, these, how do we manage these systems with much less water and, uh, you know, increasing uh, disconnection of the wetland areas with the rivers that may need replenishment by the rivers. How do we reconnect these systems with far less water um, and with much more demand on water, of course, for human needs? And that, um, that you know, as we use that word nexus, that's really important to try to uh, build in a future, uh, build in now future thinking. And I think that's a, that's both a research question and a challenge all all in the same all at the same time because it requires people to think differently and um, to integrate more holistically and most of our governments tend to operate on much shorter uh, cycles and terms and we're trying to get you know 20 30 year uh, thinking ahead um, and it doesn't often happen so that that to me is it's less of a research problem and more of a you know more of an integrated future thinking management problem because I think many of the many of the answers are, are kind of out there. There's a lot of engineering solutions to what what we have with water scarcity. You know, those those solutions are well described and they're quite successful. It's really institutional. I agree with Eva. So much of this is about governance and institution. And it is slow because uh, it requires people to change uh, their attitudes and that is a slow, slow process. Um, so yeah, I think that's to me it's the climate change issue and how do we deal how do we deal with that now, not in twenty years time? Great. And Andy, geothermal, what are the, some of the big unsolved questions left for students who might be watching out there to solve? So many, <laughs> so many questions. Just a plethora of questions. Biological, geological, financial. All questions are open. There's so many questions to be answered. I, I want to focus on what Deborah just said, and I totally endorse your commentary there, Deborah, about, you know, um, the whole environmental long-term CO2 emissions management technology. Where are all the technologies? How are they being adopted and used? Where is the promotion of incubation around ideas and adoption? You know, in New Zealand, we've got a whole lot of frameworks around um, you know, financial mechanisms, but where are the technologies here? Where is that? And so <clears throat> for me, I totally support that. You know, how do we move outside of these political cycle cycles of, you know, what we think is leadership? You know, so for us, I agree, you know, 
in geothermal, no project has ever been screwed up because of the resource. It's always a human. A human mm. screws it up. So, mm. you know, where is the leadership for our long-term, you know, space? Political cycles are short. Natural cycles, science cycles are much longer. They're much greater than those political cycles. Um, how do we motivate, engage, and engage with influencers and enablers to um, in a meaningful way so that we can you know, we can act and do things that help our future from a science perspective. Um, we, you know, in, in geothermal, we need to change the narrative too. You know, we we say the word geothermal and the first thing we have to explain what geothermal is because everyone's like, what is that? So we, we don't speak in a way that enables people to understand that, you know, geothermal energy is, is more than a substitute. You know, you don't just plug it in instead of gas or, you know, into a system. It's, you know, we, Geothermal can answer some questions around, you know, food production in environments where they couldn't provide food, um, around economic development, create jobs in rural locations, um, access to water, you know, deeper water um, um, use and poverty in regions. So we've got some answers, but we don't speak about it in a way um, that is easy for people to understand or get on board with. We just focus on talking to our technical selves. And I think that's a real key. How does science talk to decision makers and investors and enablers. Um, how do we turn their faces? Because if they saw what we could do for the planet, then perhaps, you know, in an easy way, they could adopt it and help us make it happen. I also think it's really hard. Um, so we've got a whole lot of ideas, but how do you find them the funding pathway? How do you get the oxygen you need to do the work? And, and, and we have to work on how to tie in the drivers of the people with the funds into what we're doing. So how do we give them the answers to their questions that they need to find through our work? And, you know, governments are clients and people and people in science don't think about that. They just think they're a pot of money. But <laughs> governments need to answer questions and there are drivers that they need to, you know, achieve personally and as organisations. So th I, I offer some recommendations to some of the people listening is think about what the government group you're trying to get funding from is trying to say that they do and align your work or some word smithing to align so that they might be easier to get some funding from perhaps mm. sorry a couple i went on and no, on there and I, I agree with everything that's been said and in particular the challenge of climate change and the huge research we've got to do in that space. I am going to move us on into the Q&A section now um, and take some questions from those of you watching. Please um, just type some questions in and it will pop up on our screen magically. Um, so I will read them out. So the first one is here. I'll start with this one. Um, well, it's related to what we've been talking about. Um, Nebi asks, what are some of the possible research questions for problems to solve appropriate for middle school students uh, that integrate sustainable energy and water issues? So what can some of our school students be looking at? Have you got any ideas, maybe Eva, starting with you? Well, um, it would be really interesting. So what we have, and I would like to encourage um, students who are listening, what we have is actually an online hub, we call it, called Resilient Rivers Hub. Uh, if you can go online, just do a Google of Resilient Rivers Hub. And there are two questions there, actually. It's, it's a questionnaire. And the first one is around where you think your rivers are in the journey towards resilience. It will be interesting for students to have a look at where your rivers are. But more importantly, I think it's, it's very heartwarming to actually hear the vision of the younger generation as to where would you want your particular river to be in that journey. So it starts actually from, you know, how we, we start building up a, a, um, a river where we say it's, it's more a cultural focus and then it gets very populated and then we have sewage and then we have all these other pollutants that go into the river. Eventually people realize, oh, we cannot keep on doing this and then we transform the river. So when you look at Singapore, Singapore is a good story. They transform the river realizing that they cannot let this happen and so they picked it up and they then transitioned the river into a, a healthy waterway um, uh, river, but then it, we have to move on. It's not good enough to just say we have a healthy river. We really need to go along the journey of resilient rivers. So that's one I think, Kapwa, that I, I, I'm I'm quite happy to to share online in terms of um, the website that we use. And the other one is uh, we also have a quiz which actually um, you students can use and they could 
think of a river in their mind and then they could run the quiz and they will know the personality of the river. So we give, we give rivers different personalities. You know, if you're a working river or you're already a degraded river or you're a sacred river, a cultural river, like when you look at Ganges, when you look at, um, actually when you mentioned about cultural values, Cap, that's actually very close to my heart. I did some work on developing report card and uh, cult in incorporating the cultural values in the Waikato River. Um, back then, working with a with a Tainui Waikato uh, group, it was such a very um, how do I say that heartwarming, but also very uh, humbling experience for me to do that. So back to the quiz, middle school kids could easily just go onto the quiz, run the quiz. We show photos, and then they could just say, "What's what's the personality of the river?" And then they could think about what what personality do they want the rivers to be. So these are some of the simple ones that, that kids can do in relation to the rivers. Yeah, great. I'd also like to just offer up some suggestions here too. Same thing around um, how do we create citizen monitors? How do we empower our kids and our communities to understand how to measure the health and well-being of the environment around them, whether that's um, the waterway, whether that's the species or um, natural flora or fauna that grow in the area. How do we arm them with the knowledge to be able to tell when the environment is happy and healthy um, and when the environment is perhaps suffering a bit and, and how to identify the sources of that suffering. So that's just uh, my five cents. I don't know, Andy or Deborah, if you would like to offer something up. Otherwise, I'll, I've got um, Well, I'll just, uh, one suggestion, I think they're, they're all great suggestions, but one thing that uh, students can do with, um, you know, with their mobile phones and technology is, uh, and this is not an original idea, this is um, completely plagiarising this from uh, from Brian Richter, but to, uh, to go out and uh, talk to your students with your mobile phone and ask them, where does your water come from? And see what, and find out how much you really know. Um, you know, where does that cup of water from your tap, where does it actually come from? When you switch on your light, where does that energy come from? And I think from that, that will generate a lot, lot of, oh, I don't know. And then that's the curiosity element that we hope to spark um, in, in students for science. That's great. Um, we've got another question here from Victoria Sage. What can be done to help coastal communities such as the Marshall Islands? Who wants to jump in here? I can probably start, Cap, if you can hear me okay. Yes, we can. I just had a little bit of a glitch before. Um, the Marshall Islands, like all the other Pacific Islands, of course, the major challenge we have there is sea level, sea level rise, right? So we get flooding, but we also get sea, le sea level rise. And we all know that these are implications of climate change. So first of all, I think with climate change, the first step, Deb has indicated one of the challenge, is a communication, that it is a real issue. It is happening out there. And I think when you look at um, some countries, leaders around the world are, are um, diverse in how they they look or push or understand or accept climate change, right? So the first step I would suggest is really a, a very clear communication and adoption process that climate change is real and it's happening and it's going to cause um, um, issues like, like um, sea level rise and coastal erosion and extreme flooding because of the extreme um, events. So that's probably the first one. The second one is around the concept of resilience and adaptation. And so these, these there are several mechanisms by which especially com coastal communities can look into um, adaptation process associated with you know, sea level rise and, and climate change, both physical, but also around behavioral changes, right? Um, you know, so that's within the community itself and we, within the, the but, but it is an international problem for all of us, right? It's not just the Marshall Islands, uh, issue. It is actually for, for the world to really look at, you know, you, you, you talked about it, Cap, how do we decrease greenhouse gas? How do we ensure that we, we cannot halt climate change, but we, we could at least slow it down? Um, and especially uh, for the islands, for the Pacific islands that are really under extreme risk. So maybe that's my piece and maybe I'll hand over to the others in terms of how you could answer that question. Well, I've got two other questions and then I think we're going to wrap it up because that's our hour done. The first one is for you, Deborah. I've been asked twice now. <laughs> uh, 
What is the name? Which river in Africa mm. were you talking about earlier? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I honestly can't remember. It was a small, it was, wasn't was a big river. It was a small river. And I think it was in the Central African Republic, as it was known back then. Um, I'd have to get back to you on that one. I'd have to go back through my old travel diary and see if I could find the actual name. Um, and I, I learned about it through the Lonely Planet books. I was reading about reading about it, uh, you know, Guide to Africa at the time, sitting right next to this creek or small river. So I'm sorry, I actually can't answer that directly at the moment. No worries. And then the final question I'm going to hand over to you, Andy, um, which is from Clara. How might we promote integrated future thinking in the energy, water and climate change action space? <laughs> so should I solve the whole problem? Um, I think the important thing is to uh, that we continue to talk outside of ourselves, that we connect outside of our industries and where we're focused and look at a more holistic way at look at we're addressing problems. So I would say reach out to others, um, think about how your science fits into others uh science streams and and reach out and have discussions stop talking to yourselves um talk to other people and um learn how to talk about your science so that your grandparents can understand it um i just got offer a couple of bits of advice build some allies for your career build people who are going to stand by you who will read your emails and tell you you look like an idiot or that you'll look great or to do this um who uh learn how to talk about like i said to your science to your grandparents so they understand it uh, don't worry that if, if you think you're a freak because we're all freaks. We don't all fit in, and that's the best part about science is you know not fitting in. So science is creative; it's not not creative. And don't stop because the world needs you. So do not stop. Keep charging. So that's all that I have to say. Thanks, Carps. Awesome. Thanks, Andy, and thanks, Deborah, and thanks, Eva. I think yeah. we're going to wrap it up now. Um, any final words? Otherwise, we will hand it back to you, Sue, if you're going to jump back on the screen. Hi. Yeah. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, so much. This has been a really fascinating hour. We've had some questions we've been unable to get to. Uh, I wish we had longer because I think this is a conversation that could, uh, could take up quite a lot of time and still be fascinating. So um, Andy, Kapua, Deborah, Eva, thank you very much. And everyone on YouTube and Facebook, thank you for watching. Um, please join us for our other webinars tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.